coming to you from historic Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God refuses to be just one more priority on a list of other priorities. This is the problem when people talk about God or the faith being a priority. When that, ha when that happens, all that's done is that God is placed on a list of other things that may or may not bump him out of the heart and mind of the one making the list. God is not okay with being just another item on a list of things that you care about. And to make this point, Jesus has some very bracing, even shocking words for us this morning. Jesus said to those who were accompanying him on his way to Jerusalem, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Let that sink in. Every sharp edge, every jagged corner of those words. Don't resist it. Don't look for ways around it. Let these words unfold. This is a hard saying from Jesus, and we do injustice to the words of our Lord if the first thing that we do is to look for a way out from under their weight, a way out from realizing their importance. Now, as we turn our minds and hearts to consider these words from our Lord, we have to ask ourselves, what does Jesus mean by the word hate here? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, the word hate is so widely misused in our society. The label of hater or hate speech or even hate crime is so overly and inappropriately used that it's come to mean any and all disagreement. But in its proper use in English, hate carries a very strong meaning. It's beyond distaste or disagreement. It's more than a misunderstanding or rejection. It's not cold indifference. It means that you actively root against something or someone. It means that you want something bad to happen to the hated. So could this be what Jesus is calling those who would be his disciples to do? Now, when it comes to Scripture, we have to look into context. We have to look at the verses around a passage. We have to look at the entire book of the Bible that that passage is in in order to understand that verse. We have to look at all of Scripture to shed light on those passages that are difficult for us to understand. And what do we find? Well, first of all, we find that hate, as it is used in Scripture, doesn't always carry the same meaning that we have in English, whether we use it incorrectly to refer to disagreement or properly to refer to bitter loathing. If we look at a place where it's used, it's used to describe one of Jacob's wives in the book of Genesis. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Now, Jacob didn't hate Leah, not in the sense that we think of the word. After all, he had six sons with her. He provided for her and their children in the wilderness. But Jacob did favor his other wife, Rachel, over Leah, to the point that any opportunity to favor her, he took. He gave Rachel's children preferential treatment. Now, it also helps us shed light on this passage is that we know the fourth commandment in which the Lord commands us, you shall honor your father and your mother, that, they should not, that we should not despise or anger them, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. 
Now, Jesus' words here in our gospel reading this morning seem to be more along the lines of love and hate that we have in the example of Jacob and Leah. Jesus is talking about favoring, showing preference, giving a higher status. Jesus is saying that he's not willing to be just another name of importance for those who would follow him. He's not even willing to just be the top name. He's not a priority. He's God, the giver of all of these other good people and things, the one who should be feared, loved, and trusted above all things. But Jesus doesn't stop with his discussion of not favoring people or things in this world more than God. He also includes loving ourselves, giving ourselves preferential treatment, holding our own thoughts and opinions and words in higher esteem than the Lord. He tells his disciples, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, this part often gets overlooked because we're so shocked by what Jesus has said in the previous verse that we're either still trying to decipher it or we've tuned him out because we don't want to hear it. But Jesus continues by saying that we must not even hold our own lives in regard over God. He tells us to bear our own cross and follow him. Now, this is an especially surprising thing to hear from Jesus because at the time that he said this, those who were carrying crosses were on their way to death. We see this in Jesus' own earthly life. He was forced to carry his own cross out of Jerusalem until he physically wasn't able to carry it anymore. And at that point, Simon of Cyrene was compelled to carry it for him. But for anyone to carry a cross meant that execution was imminent. And here Jesus tells us to carry our own crosses. He's telling us to put our own lives, our own imagined wisdom, our arrogance, our highly regarded personal opinions, our ideas about how God should be running things, we should take them and put them to death. Indeed, he's telling us to die, to die to sin, to die to the world, and yes, even to die to ourselves. When it comes to God, we can't be willing to show preferential treatment to father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, or even ourselves. Now, we don't like this. This talk of dying, this language of crosses and crucifixion and being put to death is not what we want to hear God talk about. It's terrifying. It's ugly. We don't want it. We'd much rather have a God that teaches us how to be mini-gods. We want to become clean, shiny, golden little idols in the shrine of our own hearts. That's what we'd prefer. But that's not what Jesus gives us. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now this talk about carrying the cross is frightening to our weak, fleshly focused hearts. But when we're willing to get past ourselves, past our notions of how things should be, past our desire for what we think Jesus should say, when we get past all that, we actually find out that there's something else, something beautiful, something marvelous hidden in those words of Jesus. Death, dying, crosses, they all lead us somewhere else. Resurrection and eternal life. And that's the destination that Jesus is calling us to. Jesus calls us to follow him into death and resurrection. It's because of this, because what Jesus is offering us is eternal, because what he's giving us is life itself, 
It's because of this that we see how important it is that nothing gets between us and our Lord. Not father or mother or wife or children or brothers or sisters or yes, even ourselves, no matter how great or beautiful these things may be on this side of eternity. If you need another way to think about it, don't think about yourself being the one that's being called to hate, but think about how much you would hate it if you were the one that stood between your loved one and God. Would you rather them reject you to receive eternal life, or would you rather be the one that keeps them from receiving it? When we think about it in this way, it helps us get things in perspective to realize that nothing else can give any of us eternal life. Nothing else can give us resurrection from the dead. Nothing else will be able to save us now and forever. Eternal life hinges on this one thing that we need and that Jesus has. And when we have that, when we have the promise of everlasting life and victory over the grave, what else could we possibly need? What else could hold a candle to this most gracious, most magnificent promise from God? But we still worry. We'll still line up all of our idols, all of our ideas about what should be good and right, all of our opinions, and we marshal them to march against this word from God. After all, we think, all of that eternity stuff doesn't help us here and now. And so we crouch behind a shield of what we call realism, which is nothing more than our arrogant declarations about what God should have said. We pick up pragmatism like a spear and wave it over our heads. We muster our questions on the battlefield, 10,000 strong, and we start to march against God. Now it's when we worry, when we start to make idols again, that we need to be brought back time and time again, to the cross. We need to bear our cross. We need to die to our imagined wisdom and ourselves so that we can see Jesus' cross. For it's at His cross that we need to receive forgiveness for all of these sins, these sins of not loving God above all things, these sins of defying Him and looking for ways around His Word, these sins of trying to sit on his throne and rule over what he has made. Now, we might think at times that we have the upper hand, that we know better than God, that we have an army of 10,000 objections that will win the day. But the truth is that with one little word, God can defeat them. Jesus said, or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not first sit down and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. When we try to let anything stand between us and God, when we make the one who desires to give us eternal life just one more priority on a list of priorities, it's then that we need to realize that we're marching against the stronger king. We might have 10,000 objections to fight for us, but he has 20,000. We need to ask for terms of peace. A delegation needs to be sent. and one has been. Miraculously, though, it was sent by the stronger king. Jesus has been sent as the delegation of peace. Knowing that we could not merit eternal life by our own struggling and fighting, knowing that we couldn't wrench it out of his hand by force, God sent his son to give us terms of peace. And what were those terms? the Son of God would die in the place of the guilty. He would take the punishment that we had earned. He would feel 20,000 swords and spears and arrows pierce Him rather than we who had set ourselves against the King. And because of this, 
we would receive peace with God. Our trespasses are forgiven. We are welcomed back into the kingdom. We are given eternity, resurrection from the dead, life everlasting. Now in the face of all of our worries, all of our objections, all of our discomfort, all of our opinions, God faces us with this reality. He is concerned with your eternal fate. He doesn't want you to be the laughing stock of demons whom would try to mock us for beginning our way in the faith and not being able to complete it. He doesn't want us to be obliterated by superior force. He doesn't want anything to stand in the way of forgiveness and eternal life that he has to give all of his redeemed children. He wants you to live. He wants to give you eternity with him and all who have been forgiven and claimed by him. He wants to pour out every good gift on us, on our fathers and mothers and wives and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even on you, looking to him for life and peace. He has called you to resurrection and life. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and resurrection. Amen.